So for the past three weeks, we've been studying the Ten Commandments in a series I'm calling Love God and Love Others. This is the heart of the Ten Commandments. Some of you might remember the first four Ten Commandments are about loving God. The last six Ten Commandments are about loving other people. So we've been dealing with all that, and today we're going to deal with the fourth commandment, which is in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and that is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So let's look at that. Exodus 20, verse 8 says this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or female servant, or your livestock, or your sojourner within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And some of you are hearing this and saying, okay, on six days we work and on the seventh day we shouldn't do anything. And then our son or daughter, which are like, they don't do anything already. And um, <laughs> you don't have a male servant or a female servant. So you're like, I got this, okay. I got most of this. But the truth be told is this is uh, a, a, a commandment that's interesting because it's God commanding us and saying, take it easy, rest. Can you imagine how messed up we are that we need a command to tell us to stop, okay? So that's what God is telling his people and he's telling us for today. But before we learn how we today observe the fourth commandment as believers, um, what we need to deal with are a few issues surrounding this commandment. The first issue is this. Did the Sabbath concept start with the Ten Commandments? Okay, did this concept start with the Ten Commandments? When God gave this Ten Commandments, was this the first mention? Obviously it's not because actually in the commandment there's a reference to Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 2 that says this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So basically what God is modeling here right off the bat is this work rest cycle that he desires us to have in our lives because we, he knows that we need it. This will be for all times, for all people. Even people that do not believe, and you could try this, if you go to work tomorrow, school, wherever you go, find an unbeliever, somebody that doesn't even believe, and, and ask them, do you believe that rest is important? Okay, ask them that. And I'm sure they're going to give you the answer that, of course, rest is important. I need rest, I need time off, I need to sleep, I need rest. Rest is the one thing, rest is one thing, but then when we look in the Old Testament, we see uh, this Sabbath law. We see a lot of rules and regulations that, uh, that the people were supposed to do during the Sabbath, and it really brings it to the next level. It's not just not working, it's not just resting, but it's like kind of like a new level. So this brings us to the next issue, and that is this. Why don't we observe the Sabbath the way they did under the law. Why don't we observe the Sabbath the way they did under the law? See, when we study the Old Testament, we'll find rules and regulations in which God's people essentially were not allowed to do much. So why don't we observe the Sabbath the way they did under the law? Well, we don't follow those regulations. So the simple answer to this is Jesus, okay? The simple answer to this is Jesus. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to Mark chapter 2. And just to give you a little background, Jesus was walking around, he was doing miracles, he was with his disciples, and all of a sudden, as they were walking, something happened. And here's what happened. Mark chapter 2, picking up in verse 23, it says this. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you, not, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, 
not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here's what was happening. Jesus was giving some clarification on the purpose of the Sabbath. God's people became very religious and legalistic about Sabbath keeping. Essentially what happened, they got to the point where meeting personal needs and doing good became illegal, okay? So the religious leaders were going around saying, oh, you can't do this on the Sabbath, can't do that on the Sabbath. So the disciples are walking, they're plucking grain to eat because they're hungry, and they're saying, well, that's not legal to do. And then in another account, Jesus actually heals people on the Sabbath. So basically, the religious leaders came after him and said, what are you doing? You're doing work on the Sabbath. And Jesus basically says to them, listen, the Sabbath was made for man. Man is not to serve the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was for man's benefit. So if someone is in need or there's good to do, it's ridiculous to actually look at the Sabbath and say, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Hope you, hope you get your needs met today. I'm not sure how it's going to be done, but uh, if, if you're here tomorrow, I'll help you out. So Jesus is saying, you religious leaders have it all wrong. You have it all wrong. The Sabbath was to benefit the people. Listen to this. The Sabbath was to benefit the people to keep us physically and spiritually healthy. That's why if you talk to an unbeliever and ask them, hey, do you think rest is important? Of course they're going to say rest is important. Why? Because it's, it's about our health, isn't it? So Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Sabbath rest is not something we ignore. It's not something we say, oh, you can if you want to. But it's also something that Jesus desires us to do. Because some of you might even heard the fourth commandment is the only commandment that's not repeated in the New Testament. Well, the truth be told is this. This brings us to the final issue, and that is this. Why worship rest is on Sunday and not on Saturday as the Jewish tradition was. Because then we look at this and we read and we, we learn about the Sabbath. And if you know any Jewish people, if you have any Jewish friends or know any Jewish people, you know that their Sabbath is on Saturday. So why all of a sudden is it on Sunday for believers in Christ? Well, obviously the simple answer to that is Jesus rose on a Sunday. See, we celebrate here because Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to die for our sins on the cross. Three days later, he rose again on a Sunday. And he rose again to prove that he is God, to prove that he can die on the cross for our sins, to prove that he could pay for our sins and do everything required we need for salvation. And the scriptures tell us this, all who believe will have eternal life. So now what happens is we see the early church in Acts came together on the first day of the week, Sunday, to worship and rest. In other words, not work and focus on Jesus. So think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. I remember one commentator was saying this. He said, if you left this country, if you left this country, if you were a believer in Christ, you left this country, and all your believers were left behind, you had no, no contact with all the believers in this country, and then you came back three months later, and all of a sudden, all the believers in the whole country were worshiping on Monday. Would you ask a question? Would you be like, what's going on? Why are you guys doing this on Monday? Okay. Well, that's the same thing with the early believers. Because by and large, most of them were Jewish people that celebrated and observed the Sabbath. Jesus rose from the grave, and all of a sudden, all these who believed were now worshiping on Sunday. In Acts chapter 20, it says this, on the first day of the week, when they gathered together to break bread. So we see through the book of Acts that they started to gather together to worship. So they no longer were calling it the Sabbath, but they were calling it the Lord's Day. And we connect, as believers today in 2019, we connect it to the fourth commandment because it has to do with loving God and honoring one day of the week to observe the fourth commandment. So those are some issues, but now as believers, we have to come to the conclusion of how do we observe the fourth commandment? How do we observe the fourth commandment? And there's three ways that we're going to observe the fourth commandment. The first is pretty evident, okay, and that is worshiping Jesus. Worshiping Jesus. Acts 2.42 says it this way. 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. As believers, we need to set aside time to worship Jesus. As I was preparing this, the thought in my head was, okay, like these people are here. They're the ones hearing it, so it's kind of like I'm preaching to the choir. They made this a priority. They're here today. I'm glad. There might be a couple of a couple of you who are a little rogue, like haven't been here in like six months. You're like, oh, now the pastor's telling me i got to come to church every week. Um, here's the thing. This is so important for you as a believer to worship Jesus, to set aside time to come together with fellow believers, to reset, to refocus, to give thanks, to encourage one another, to pray, to have communion, to hear from God's word, to praise him, to lift his name and praises. And you know what? There's always going to be reasons why it doesn't work or it doesn't fit in or you don't feel like it. I want to turn your attention to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, says, says this. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So now what the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, listen, you got to get together on the Lord's day and spend time meeting together. Spend time in the word. Spend time praising the Lord. Don't get in the habit of not doing that as some have been in the habit of doing. And you know this to be true in your own life, right? If you get into the habit of not doing, it's so hard to get back in the habit of doing it, okay? It's so hard to get back in the habit of going to church. And you know what? You'll have those voices in your head, right? Well, if I go back there, people are going to be like, where were you, okay? And they're, do they're probably doing that because they're, they're concerned, right? Or maybe somebody from church sees you at ShopRite, and they're like, oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. And you interpret it as like, I can't believe they're judging me because I haven't been here there in a while. And, you know, and for me as a pastor, sometimes it's kind of weird. Like, do I say anything? Okay. Like, because people are going to think I'm judging them, but I'm not. I just care about them and want to make sure that they're doing what the Lord desires of them. So setting aside a day to worship is designed to help us not only to obey the fourth commandment, but it's actually designed to help us in our struggles and make sense of our lives. People say things like this to me sometimes at the door. They'll be like, you know what, Pastor Mike? I wasn't going to come today, but then I came out and I heard something that really helped me, that really inspired me, that really encouraged me. My response is never, really? I'm never surprised, okay? I'm never surprised by that because I know that when we open God's word and hear from it, it's going to help you. That's why he wants us here. That's why he wants us together in community to worship together because he knows it's going to help us. So when you wake up on that Sunday morning, you're like, oh, I don't really feel like it. Oh, it's just like it. That's the time you really, really need to get yourself out of bed and get to worship because it's going to help you in your times of struggles. I love uh, what Kevin DeYoung says about the importance of weekly worship. He says this, when you are physically sick, you seek out a doctor for a diagnosis and a cure. But in the case of spiritual sickness, we rarely look for a diagnosis or a cure. Yet here God, the great physician, is saying to us, I'll give you one day of the seven to attend to your soul, to come to worship, to grow, to breathe, and to be nourished. Why would that day of worship not be a priority? You get that? If you have a problem, right, you look to have it solved, but for some reason, when it's a spiritual problem, we kind of ignore it. We just look and say, oh, whatever. And sometimes we could even fall into this trap of looking at worship service as an option, okay? Let me just tell you, you need to get to the point, and I'm not trying to guilt anyone, you need to get to the point in your faith where you come to the conclusion that you say worship service is the option. You get that? Okay, you can't say it's an option. It's the option. You can't just wake up and be like, well, it is nice out. 
you know what? I don't want to sit inside today, okay? You, 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 it's not the option, okay? And let me just tell you this, and I'm not patting our church on the back. We have a lot of faithful volunteers, our worship teams, all the people that do stuff. You come here, you're at the 10 o'clock service, and, and you're, you, know, you, you, you sing the songs, and you worship, and you hear the message, and this and that. Do you realize we do this three times every Sunday? It's a space issue for us. But it's also, we want to give people options because we know that life can be busy. So we have three options every Sunday for people to come and worship, not because we're like, okay, let's just bow to everybody's needs, but because we're like, this is important. So if it's important, we put our best foot forward. So all our worship teams and stuff, they're here at 7.30 in the morning practicing. They rehearse during the week. They're here till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Obviously, you can see we have many different people, young people, older people, helping out in that way. They're putting their best foot forward. Why? So you can come here and worship. Imagine if everybody had this thought on a beautiful day like this. Eh, it's a nice day. I'm going to go to the beach. It'd be me and the worship team singing to an empty room, right? That's what it would be, okay? So it's got to be a priority for you as a believer. Matt Mikulak, he was my youth pastor growing up. And uh, he works at Karen University. He spoke here about two years ago. He just did a podcast with the Karen University podcast um, that they have. And they interviewed him about uh, raising teenagers. I think we posted on Facebook. It's a, a phenomenal interview. Matt is an amazing, godly, godly person. And uh, he was challenging parents of teenagers. And this is what he said. He said, if you make weekly worship a priority, you are communicating to your kids what is important. If you don't, you are communicating to them that it's not. Plain and simple, if you're a parent, what are you communicating to your kids? If you communicate, and guess what? I have people that are, you know, in this church that have adult children and stuff. They're like, oh, you know, I'm discouraged because my kid doesn't even go to church. And I don't ask them this question, but maybe the question should have been, hey, did you make it a priority when they were kids? Did you make that a priority? You know, and if you didn't, guess what? they might not feel that it's a priority right now in their life. But those that realize that their parents made it a priority kind of come back to that. Remember that whole train up a child in the way they should go? Remember that whole thing? Well, here's the truth. We need to make it a priority. But with that, I know there is always what if questions. And people always ask me what if questions. And this is the biggest one right here. What if I have to work on Sundays? I do realize that there are jobs out there, law enforcement, different things that, hey, you don't have much of a choice, okay? Your shift is on the Sunday, and that's the way kind of the world works, okay? So here's what you need to do. There's, there's a couple of things you can do if this is your case. The first is check to find out, hey, maybe, you know what, maybe I don't have to work on a Sunday. I'm going to talk to my boss, talk to my supervisor, find out if there is a possibility that I can get a different, different shift. If it's not a possibility, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. You need to find a weekly Bible study that you can plug into. Keep up with the sermons and stuff so you're kept up with things that, you know, our whole church is learning. And if, if you have a hard time keeping up with the sermons, you got some problems, okay? Because we have our own app. We have our own website. We're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. We're on YouTube. We're on Vimeo. And we're everywhere, okay? We're literally taking over the Internet, Okay? <laughs> You can keep up, okay? The reason why we put it out there is so you can keep up. And not only that, we can be a gospel witness to the community, to the internet, right? So make it a priority also to attend other church events because being a part of worship is also being a part of a fellowship of people. You know, don't just get, don't fall into this trap. And I, I want to be sensitive about this, but don't fall into this trap. Well, you know what? I got to work so I don't have to attend to my soul. Okay? Don't fall into that trap. I got to work. It's not possible. So I don't have to worry about doing other things. Hey, I do my devotions and I pray. So that should be enough. The life of a believer is so much more than that. So much more than that. Again, I want to be sensitive because I know there's people that do have a struggle with this because of their profession. The next way we observe the fourth commandment is by trusting Jesus. Now, God took care of his people. And we have to believe that God will take care of us. Now, this is a big issue for those of you who think, I have to provide, I can't stop. I'm not just talking about time off for worship now. I'm talking about 
this concept of rest, okay? Because the American culture is probably one of the only cultures that if somebody's like, I work 70 to 80 hours a week, people are like, wow, that person works hard, okay? Nobody says, like, that person's disobedient, okay? Nobody says that. Have you ever heard somebody say that? But the truth be told is, you're actually being disobedient. If you burn the candle at both ends, you are being disobedient because God says rest. Think about it this way. It, what does it say in creation? God created in six days and the seventh day he rested. Let me ask you a question. I ask this all the time. Did God need rest? Anybody? Was God like, oh, I'm tired. Okay. I have no strength to draw on right now. No. Okay. God modeled that for us because he knows that we need it. If you refuse to take time to rest and rejuvenate, you are communicating to God, I don't believe you're going to take care of it. That's what you're saying. You're communicating to God, I don't believe you're going to take care of this. I need to keep on going, keep on running, to provide, to provide, to provide. I'm a hard worker. I got to do this on my own. And that's what you're saying. I'm not saying this is just a male problem, but it kind of is for some guys. I need to provide, need to provide, need to provide. See, in the Old Testament, resting on the Sabbath communicated that they trusted God because they listened and obeyed to what God told them. Sure, they could have spent time harvesting their crops. Sure, they could have spent time tending to their animals. But the point was, they took one day a week and they said, I'm not doing it because God told me not to do it. I trust you, God, that you will take care of this. You know what? It's the same for us today. It's the same for us today. And I can guarantee you this. It's a freeing feeling to actually say, you know what? God wants me to rest. He wants me to relax. He wants me to stop. And he's going to take care of it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Really popular memory verse. I would highly suggest it. But I want to read this to you. And, and I want to kind of plug this into this rest concept. It says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. Now, I love this verse because he says, lean not on your own understanding. You may, at some point, say this. It does not make sense for me to slow down or take off. This needs to get done. Well, let me just tell you, you're leaning on your own understanding. You're leaning on your own understanding. It doesn't make sense to you. But you know what? God is saying, you need to stop. So you need to remember that God says rest, and he says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. So you might say, it doesn't make sense that I take a rest. I need to get this done. I have deadlines. I need to get this done. And he's saying, you know what? You need to stop, and you need to acknowledge me. You need to ask me. You need to pray to me and ask me for help with this. You need to stop, and you need to rest, and you need to rejuvenate, and you need to acknowledge me. In other words... Since resting right now does not make sense to you, go to him and ask him what you should be doing for guidance and direction. And you know what? In all your ways, acknowledge him first. What does the rest of the verse say? And he will make a mess of your life because you're a lazy bum, right? No. It says, and he will make your path straight. He's going to work it out. If you're obedient to him and listen to what he does, it's so sick when I think about this that we have a command that tells us that we have to stop, okay? It just shows how messed up we are, doesn't it? Because we think we're doing this on our own. But he's saying, you know what? You make rest a priority and it'll work out. Why? Because God will work it out. And you can trust him to work it out. Let me just tell you that. You can trust him to work it out. The final way that we observe the fourth commandment is through resting in Jesus. Now, this point takes us beyond the day off and brings us to the point in which no matter what situation you find yourself in, you can find rest in the Lord. Because you know what? There are some things in life that are never going to get done. There are some issues and situations that are never going to be worked out. Okay, You will die before these things are worked out, and they might never be worked out. So that's where you need to rest in Jesus. Now, Hebrews 3 and 4, I'm not going to study these two passages, but I just want to tell you what is going on. It teaches us that the Sabbath points to eternal rest that we will have in Jesus when we believe. So in the passage, it speaks about those who did not believe 
did not enter into the rest of God, talking about those that were in slavery and uh, came out of slavery in Egypt. And he said, those that didn't believe, that didn't rest in me, they didn't inherit that eternal rest. So the Sabbath rest points to the fact that it's not by works that we are saved. So you get this? Here's what's happening here. God is teaching us. He's saying, listen, when you stop and you rest and you worship, you're being reminded that you didn't work for your salvation either. He did the work for you. You're resting in his work. Hebrews 4, 9 says this, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So it's saying, you've rested from your works. You did not achieve salvation on your own. You've rested from your works. You did not rely on your own strength to even be saved. Resting is a reminder that we can't have salvation in our own strength. We need to rest from our works so we can rest in the work of Christ. So what I want to do is I want to close with just a few practical tips to help you rest from your work and focus on the Lord. Sometimes we need some practical tips. The first, and we discussed it a little bit, is make worship a priority. Make worship a priority. I don't care what your schedule is like. You need to say to yourself, okay, what are my priorities in life? Okay. Worship needs to be a priority. We dealt with the people that, you know, some, some people have to work. You're going to have to deal with, with some issues there. But make it a priority. Just say, hey, you know what? This is what we do. This is what my family does. It'll pay dividends for your family. I can tell you that much. When you bring your kids up like that, um, Matt Mikulak, the, the one that I referenced before, and, uh, you know, he always made it a priority. He's still a youth pastor. He works at a university training other youth pastors. He has three sons. Let me just tell you, all three of them are youth pastors, okay? He always made it a priority in his family, and all of his children chose that same thing and no pressure from him at all. And we know Matt really well, so we know that he did not pressure his kids into doing that. It's a legacy issue. The second is this, leave your work at work. For those of you who have a hard time bringing work home, bringing work home mentally, okay, don't do that. Communicate to your coworkers or your employee, you know what, when I'm not at work, guess what? I'm not at work, okay? Don't call me, don't text me, don't email me, just leave me alone, okay? I realize that some of you don't have jobs like that. You have jobs that are like, you know, maybe a little flexible when you're in the office, so they kind of, you know, grab onto you when you're not in the office. You got to work those things out. But you have to take some time and just say, you know what, I'm not going to think about work, okay? Work will be there on Monday. I can guarantee that, okay? The next is if you have one of those jobs that maybe is, is not like your typical nine to five office job, you need to set reasonable goals for the week. You need to set reasonable goals for the week. You know, for myself in pastoral ministry, like I have to set my own goals. Like I have to say like, okay, I want my sermon done by this day. So this way I can actually rest my brain and rest my mind so that when Sunday comes, I'm ready to present God's word. You have to set reasonable goals because if you don't set reasonable goals to get those things done, when you go to rest, if you have untied things or things hanging over your head, what are you doing? You're thinking of all the things that you have to do. The next is this, limit technology, limit technology. We've been blessed and cursed, right, with this technology thing, okay? We've been blessed, and I talk about this all the time, and I realize that this is a reality for all of us. The fact that your boss or your coworkers or people can text you and email you and get you anytime. You could be out to dinner, and then you stupidly look at your phone, right? And then you're like, oh, man, there's a problem at work. And then you don't even enjoy the time that you're out with your family or your friends or your or wife or your husband because now you're thinking about what you need to do, okay? So limit it. Put downtime on it. Don't take it with you. I don't Figure it out for yourself, but you got to limit it because it's going to cause you more pain and anguish and keep you from resting. And then lastly is this. Plan activities that you can enjoy your time off. You know what? If you, if you just say, okay... I'm going to just sit around. <laughs> How long does that last, right? You're looking around, okay, this needs to be done. That needs to be done. I can get this done. I can't waste time, right? I, you know what I mean? And it, I'm the same way, trust me, okay? You need to plan activities that you can enjoy your time off. Even if it's an activity that might be strenuous to some, it might be very restful for you, okay? So you need to plan those activities, whether it's going for a hike, going to the beach, whatever you 
choose to do, you need to plan some activities so you can actually rest and rejuvenate yourself. So when we rest from our work and worship the Lord, we are showing him love, and that is the heart of the fourth commandment.